Hey y'all, it's Jennifer. Welcome back to my channel. Today I am coming to you with a video that is all about the classics that I have rated five stars. So this video is entirely inspired by Risha over at For the Love of Classics. She just did a video like this and I just thought it was fascinating to see what she had rated five stars. And earlier this year when I did kind of the five star audit video that I saw going around, I saw a bunch of booktubers doing this, I was really shocked. I saw the books that I had rated five stars and then I saw those that I had not rated five stars but that I think truly deserved it. And so I thought I would do this video kind of in a different way to Risha rather than just showing you a stack of books. I have my iPad here and what I am going to do is just open up Goodreads, sort by rating, and we are going to discover what classics I have rated five stars together. And I think I really do need to have an honest conversation with myself about my rating system because I think there are very many classics that I have rated five stars based on merit rather than enjoyment. And going into this year, I really did want to rate enjoyment higher because those are the books that I think stay present in my mind the most, are the ones that I really enjoyed and was emotionally invested in. And I feel like I give a lot of classics five stars based on their writing which is a key part of my enjoyment a lot of the time, but it's not the only thing that I'm looking for. And I find that a lot of times when I rate something five stars for the writing style, it's not a book that remains with me in my memory that much. And so I'm kind of interested to see what I have rated five stars before. And I have had Goodreads now for 10 years. And so there are things that I rated when I first got on Goodreads that I think I was rating based on uh, reading them in high school and college, and I just don't think we can trust those ratings anymore. So let's look. So I guess you can see that at the top, this is in no particular order, this is just by rating. I've rated uh, The Great Gatsby five stars. I think that's probably true. I think I would agree with that rating. Uh, and Richard III, definitely a five star for me. That is one thing that I'm interested to see is just how many Shakespeare's are on this list because I think probably I can only give five stars truly to two Shakespeare plays and they would be Richard and they would be Romeo and Juliet. We then have Frenchman's Creek by Daphne du Maurier and that is one that I really feel like I need to revisit. Frenchman's Creek is I think a fairly popular book of hers. And if you wanna know the truth, it is the first book of Daphne du Maurier's that I ever read. And I really enjoyed it. I was on the hunt for pirate books at the time. And I just remember this being the only thing that really scratched that itch for me. And I definitely read it kind of at a formative age. I feel like I read it at 14 or 15. And I really then don't think I can take this rating seriously. That is one I have intended to reread for years now, and I think I probably should. We then have Inferno by Dante. I think Inferno and the Divine Comedy will show up separately because I think I counted them twice. And Inferno is definitely a five star, I mean easily. And it is possibly just in general my favorite work that I've ever read. I really, really enjoyed it. We have Jamaica Inn by Daphne du Maurier, which is another I don't think I would give five stars today, but I think is interesting. We then have Common Sense by Thomas Paine, which gets five stars based on merit, gets five stars based on the language. Common Sense is a pamphlet that was published in the 1770s, and it was instrumental in starting up the American Revolution. I cannot stress to you how important this pamphlet was in getting the war effort up off the ground. This was an incendiary pamphlet. I am not the only one who would rate this five stars. And I think it's interesting that when you read it today, it still gets your blood pumping in the same way that it must have people who were reading it when it was first published. It's insane. We have the Iliad. And I just really love the Iliad. I've discussed this ad nauseum on my channel. The Iliad is, I think, my favorite ancient Greek work, certainly. Uh, it's definitely one of my favorite epic poems. And in general, I think I love the Iliad, not only for the story that it tells, but also for its place in literature. I think there is so much that is in the Iliad that influence later works. Once you've read the Iliad, you see it everywhere. The Iliad is one of the backbones of the Western canon, I would say, and I'm not somebody 
who would ever sit on their high horse and tell you that you should read something. Uh, but a lot of people wonder what they should read if they want to have a good background going into other classics. And I think the Iliad and I think certain books of the Bible are the two that you really need uh, to get background for stuff that's going on in classical antiquity, certainly, but also for what's going on in the medieval period and up into the modern day, essentially. These things are referenced time and again. And so the Iliad is just a special case. It's an all-around five-star. It's one of my favorites of all time. Then we have the Divine Comedy we've already spoken on, my favorite of all time. Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, uh, that's an interesting one, and I don't think I would rate it five stars today, but when I was first starting into medieval classics, it was a game changer. It was truly incendiary. It's so beautiful, and the story is just exactly what you want out of an Arthurian legend retelling, in my opinion. It is very, very modern to be a medieval poem. If you're looking to start your journey with medieval classics, I think Sir Gawain and the Green Knight is a great one. We have A Midsummer Night's Dream. I would not consider this my favorite Shakespeare, but once upon a time I did. And it's actually, I think, the only comedy or lighter play of his that I've ever rated five stars. We have The Crucible, which I think is interesting and I certainly think would fall for me if I were to reread it. This is definitely one that I kind of plugged in probably right when I started my Goodreads up. And I thoroughly enjoyed the Crucible when reading it in school, and I think it is a play that benefits from uh, community discussion. I think it's a work that really just benefits from being like a book club selection, something that you discuss in class. You're getting so much out of the discussion with other people that your opinion of the work goes up. And so I think if I read The Crucible on its own, would it get five stars from me? That would be a really interesting question. I don't think I would give it five stars today. See, I told you I was just very generous with them because we also have the Song of Roland. No way, no way would I give that five stars now. I think I was very generous with five stars when getting on to Goodreads. And I think this is just a wider conversation about classics and classics readers. It feels like because something is a classic and because it is something that was influential on other literature, that it means it's earned its place. And so I kind of think I felt, especially when I was younger, that everything that was a classic deserved five stars because it had stood the test of time. That's not true. There are some terrible classics out there. And everyone's opinions are completely different. Uh, and so I think Roland is one that is interesting in terms of what it did uh, in the medieval period and the influence that it had. But standing on its own, I don't think it's a five-star work. In fact, you can see here the general rating is like 3.5. Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad. I am one of those who quite controversially loves Heart of Darkness. I think it is so fascinating. It's beautifully written. Uh, and it's also, I think, just a really interesting conversation about colonialism. And I think that's why people slam this, because it is kind of a glorified image of colonialism in some ways. But I personally think Joseph Conrad wanted you to interrogate that. I think there's a lot going on in subtext here. And I think people slam this book for what it is on surface level. But I think the discussions of it, again, this is one that I studied in class. The discussions of it elevated this work to me beyond what it was if I had just read it. Uh, and so this is an interesting one. I think a lot of times I rate books higher after I have discussed them with other people. I feel like when we all get together and we discuss it, my opinion of the book goes up whether I enjoyed it or not because I often feel like I get so much out of that discussion with others because other people are always going to pick up on something that you don't. We have The Fairy Queen. It's an epic poem. It's an epic poem of the Renaissance specifically, and so it just really is my bread and butter. I love anything that was written during the Renaissance that's epic poetry. And Edmund Spencer is really, really talented. The Fairy Queen is one that intimidates a lot of people. The key is you do not have to read this straight through. In fact, you don't even have to read it all. I know a lot of people really uh, praise the unabridged and definitely you should. If you want to commit to it and read it unabridged, definitely do it. But I see no shame at all in reading an abridged version of this. It's something like 1,500 pages unabridged. It's incredible. And if you really get into it, 
then you can make that call. But I personally really love it. I love it in all of its unabridged glory. This is Arthurian. It's very chivalric. It feels very Renaissance Festival, Fae land. It really just has it all. Beowulf is a perennial favorite of mine. I really, really like Beowulf, but Beowulf uh, is also an epic poem of the medieval period, and this is very Viking-inspired. I think this is possibly the only Viking-inspired work that I've given five stars. A lot of the Norse sagas are not that great when you're just reading them. The idea of the story is wonderful, but the language isn't that great. Beowulf is one of those rare occasions when the language is as stunning as the story. A Beowulf was written in Old English and it actually is not a Norse saga at all, but it's about a Dane. If you've been intimidated by it before, don't be. Beowulf is actually immensely readable. We then have The Prince by Machiavelli. This is one I definitely gave five stars on merit because it's a political treatise. I really don't see how I was getting any enjoyment out of this, but I had to present on this. And so I got like emotionally invested in Niccolo Machiavelli as a person. And I still have a soft spot for him, quite a bit of a soft spot for him actually, uh, because I had to do a really long drawn out presentation on him uh, in undergrad. It was one of my final presentations it was like a 20 minute ordeal where I gave a speech on this man and on the prince specifically. And so I got really emotionally invested in him. And so I think that's why I gave this five stars. Paradise Lost by John Milton. Once again, epic poem from the Renaissance period. It is what it is. Paradise Lost is a really, really beautiful epic poem uh, that is about kind of the beginning of Genesis and the Bible, Lucifer's fall from heaven, and then also the fall of man. And it is genuinely gorgeous. It's really amazing. And what he did here is so incredible to me. I truly admire John Milton. In a similar way, it's interesting to talk about him right after Machiavelli because I feel like I am emotionally invested in him as a person too. Milton was going blind towards the end of his life and he had his daughter write this stuff down a lot of the time. And it might not have been Paradise Lost, it might have been Paradise Regained that she had to help him with, but it is incredible to me to think that this man sat there and dictated this. I'm like, this is just something that you're you're spouting up and then you go, mm, doesn't sound right, uh, change it to this. I think that's amazing, truly. He was a galaxy brain. We have Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. I've been wondering when that would pop up. That's my favorite Victorian novel, I would say. And I think in general, it's just kind of the imminent Victorian novel. This is a love it or hate it book. And I recognize that a lot of y'all probably hate it but I love Wuthering Heights and I read it for the first time as a very angsty teen and I think it just really connected with me then. But I have reread it since and thought it was still as incendiary as it was the first time. It's truly an incredible read. We then have the picture of Dorian Gray, which I think is everyone's perennial favorite. I have heard almost no one say they disliked this book. This is so beautifully written, but the story and the characters are not sacrificed for the style. This is such a short book too, but somehow it packs such an incredible punch. I am not the only one who will sing the praises of the picture of Dorian Gray, but uh, it's definitely one of my favorite Victorian novels of all time. It is so, so beautiful. I hate that Oscar Wilde only wrote one novel, but I'm so glad it was this. We then have Northanger Abbey, which I think is probably my truest favorite of Jane Austen's. I'm due for a reread of that as well. I don't think any Jane Austen is really one I would give five stars today. I have such an issue with her style uh, that nine times out of 10, I think I rate her highly because I desperately want to be a Jane Austen girly and I want to just be like everyone else who's obsessed with her. And I've come to the conclusion that I really don't think she's for me. Uh, but Northanger Abbey is, in general, my favorite of hers. It's because it seems so different from the rest of her oeuvre. We have Ivanhoe by Sir Walter Scott. I know a lot of people hate Ivanhoe. This is another one that's kind of contentious because Ivanhoe is written in an interesting way where uh, it's set in like the crusading time period. It's set during the time of Robin Hood because Robin Hood is a character in this. But everyone talks as if they are on the stage performing Shakespeare. There's a lot of vows and thighs, and it's not present in the description, it's just in their dialogue. And I think a lot of people find that so tedious. And I agree, kind of. This is just so much fun. 
if you were looking for a book to make you feel like you were at the Renaissance Festival or like you were watching A Knight's Tale with Heath Ledger, this is the book you want to read. I love Ivanhoe. I really love Sir Walter Scott. He was incredibly famous at the time and I think it's so interesting that he hasn't really remained in the public consciousness that long. He's the forefather of historical fiction and I'm certain that he's still quite famous in the UK. Certainly in Scotland he is. That's where he was from. But it seems to me like we just didn't study him in school or come across a lot of discussions of him, which I think is really bizarre. He is an incredibly fun writer, and I think maybe that's the problem. I think he's a little bit adventurous and a little bit less literary than a lot of other writers of his time. We have The Count of Monte Cristo. I feel like this should be in my top five. I love The Count of Monte Cristo, one of my favorites of all time. Certainly in my top five favorite classics of all time. It's a wild ride from start to finish. Now I know with The Fairy Queen I was telling you, no shame in going abridged. Don't go abridged with The Count of Monte Cristo. Just do yourself a favor. Assume that you're going to love it because you will. I promise you that you will. It is so much fun. This is a page turner. It does not feel nearly as long as what it looks. Uh, and I think a lot of people read an abridged version in school. That's what I did. To me, the ending of this is so rewarding because you have spent that amount of page time with the Count as a character, and you are aching for him to get these people because this is a story of revenge. By the end, you are so ready for them to get their comeuppance that it is just genuinely therapeutic to read. I love this, one of my favorites. Watership Down by Richard Adams, I read because uh, it was quite influential on the television show Lost, for those of you who remember Lost. Uh, and at one time, it was my goal to read every book that was mentioned in Lost. And this is the first one that I read on that reading journey. And Watership Down is maybe not technically a classic, but I call it one. It's more of a modern classic. And it's a story about bunnies, uh, but it's a very interesting, dark story. A lot of people think of this as a children's classic. If I had read this as a child, I would have been disturbed, truly disturbed, but wow, it's really incredible and it has aged very well. The discussions going on in it are so interesting and if you watched Lost, I think you'll get a lot out of this if you were a big fan of Lost. Romeo and Juliet, finally. This is the one I think alongside Richard III I would say is my favorite of Shakespeare's. I say this often on my channel, I'm very basic uh, and I think in terms of classics, that's fine because there's a reason why these are classics. There's a reason why these have always been popular. It's because they're good. Romeo and Juliet is so incredible. It's really amazing. Every time you read it, you get something different out of it and you can analyze it in so many different ways. I think Romeo and Juliet is dynamic. It's beautifully written. And it truly is a tale as old as time. It will never get old. It's always fresh and new. It's truly beautiful. I know a lot of people were burned bad reading Romeo and Juliet in high school. And I read it in high school too, but I loved it. Did I love it because we watched the Leonardo DiCaprio movie? We don't talk about that. We have Dr. Faustus by Christopher Marlowe. I reread this last year and I have to say... I felt like I docked at a star. I don't feel like it deserves five stars. Though I really like Christopher Marlowe, I actually don't think Dr. Faustus is his best. That's my controversial opinion. We then have The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins, another of my favorite Victorian novels. I love Wilkie Collins. I've rated so many books of Wilkie Collins as five stars. It's untold. I'm shocked that it's taken us until this point for Goodreads to order them in this way. The Woman in White is a delight from start to finish. It's full of intrigue. Uh, it's at like kind of a secluded mansion. It's just everything you want kind of a semi-gothic book to be. It's really pacey as well. It constantly keeps you turning the page. We have My Cousin Rachel by Daphne du Maurier. I think if we're counting here, Daphne du Maurier has to be the author with the most five stars so far, interestingly enough. Uh, but My Cousin Rachel is one that I think is going to rate lower or higher for you based on your feelings about the ending. I personally thought this was the perfect ending to this book, but I think a lot of people hate the way that this one ended and I really, really enjoyed it. We have Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, truly a classic. This is also in my top five favorite classics of all time. I read this when I was getting back into classics and I personally think it was just a great gateway drug. 
I was so invested in it. I thought the language was beautiful, but it wasn't intimidating. It was just a really great one to help me get back in the mind space of classics after graduating. And so I really enjoy this for a lot of different reasons. It's just a fantastic novel, but it also kind of has a soft spot in my heart for helping me get back into classics. We have Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. I'm at the point now where I think I've accepted the Great Expectations, which was my first Dickens will always be my favorite and is possibly going to be the only one that gets five stars from me. Great Expectations is one of those rare books that comes along and you find yourself thinking about it years on. When I finished this, I think I gave it four stars, but then as the weeks went on, like day to day, I was thinking about Pip. I was thinking about characters from Great Expectations constantly as if they were real. So this is one I came back to and I bumped up the rating and I think it's really one of the truest five stars on this list. We have The Ballad of the White Horse by G.K. Chesterton. This is also an epic poem and it's also about Vikings. This is about uh, Alfred the Great and the Battle of Ethendon. In some ways, I think this beats out Dante for me. This is just one of the most incredible pieces of literature I've ever had the privilege of reading. I have never read anything like this before or since. It is electrifying. I cried reading it. I was so moved by the language and just in general, the story of it. I'm really attached to Alfred the Great. That's why I picked it up. And I just was stunned by this. I cannot believe that the guy who wrote the Father Brown mysteries pumped this out. This is one of the best epic poems that I have ever read. And it's the most modern, I think, of the list so far. We have The Beetle by Richard Marsh, which is another Victorian classic that's a horror about uh, a mummy and a mummy that basically turns into a giant bug. This is fun from start to finish. It's very lighthearted, but I thought there was so much here in terms of gender dynamics and gender discussion that I really did not expect to happen. I really did not expect this to be talked about on the page the way that it was in this. So this is a later Victorian novel and I believe it was published the same year as Dracula. It's insane to me that we have talked about Dracula as much as we have and not this. I don't know why we've let this fall by the wayside. The Beetle is a great time. We have The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins. The Moonstone is definitely a five-star book, but it's not on the same level for me as The Woman in White. I really loved The Moonstone because of the mystery. I loved The Woman in White because of the characters. Well, we are at the end. The last two that I have rated five stars are The Lives of the Artists by Giorgio Vasari. I mean, that is another of my favorites, possibly my favorite classical nonfiction that I've read. I really enjoyed the way it was written. But to me, this is a five star basically because I think it was valuable to me as a point of reference when I was writing my Italian Renaissance historical fantasy, I was constantly referencing this because it was so valuable to me to see the way that painting and art design was constructed in the early Renaissance. So I was constantly returning to this time and again for reference. I think it's also really enjoyable and I thoroughly enjoyed reading it. It was so wonderful to read, but I think if you have been on the fence about this, just ask yourself how invested you are in art and in the process of painting and stuff like that. If you are not interested in kind of the background of your favorite artists and even uh, some lesser known artists, some artists with maybe no name recognition today at all, if you're not really interested in the process and the technicality of it, I think you might struggle here, but you can certainly skim those sections and you can certainly just read the artists that you are most interested in. Lastly, we have Valperga by Mary Shelley, which is her historical fiction that is set during the 1300s in Italy. 100% this book is not gonna be for everyone either, but I personally like this more than Frankenstein, believe it or not. I really took to Valperga. It is gorgeously written, and I know a lot of it is just me. I just love when things are set in Italy. And I thought there was just such power in the female characters here. Of course, Mary is a, a female writer, but I really thought it was quite shocking to read female characters that she gave this level of agency, but also just this level of dynamism, really. Uh, because I often find during uh, the Regency, the Romantic period, 
people are kind of set pieces. They're kind of archetypes in a lot of these novels. There's not a lot going on under the surface unless they are men. And so I thought this was really interesting that she gave a lot of attention to the female characters and they were never in competition with one another. I really want to stress that. It was just truly refreshing to read. So those were all the classics that I have rated five stars on Goodreads. I am sure that so many things did not make it in. There are things that I've forgotten about and things that I never updated Goodreads on. Uh, but those are the ones that I have rated five stars. I would love to know down below if you have read any of these, what you rated them, and what is your list of five star classics? Are you stingier with your ratings or less stingy than I am? But that's going to be all for me today. I hope you're all having a great week. Happy reading. Goodbye.